Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for being here. My name is Nick Davis. I'm the Head of Innovation and Society at the World Economic Forum, uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor here at Swinburne University with the um, Social Innovation Research Institute. And um, I'm tremendously excited to be here because in my role at the World Economic Forum, I have a pretty unique position. I get to work on strategies around innovation, policy, technology governance, but really 100% focused and oriented towards the social impact that those have. And that's exactly why I'm also delighted and privileged to be an adjunct professor here at Swinburne, because Swinburne is a unique university in Australia. The way that it combines being on the cutting edge of technology, particularly the applied science aspects of manufacturing, at the same time as being really oriented towards social impact, towards community engagement, um, and indeed the, the arts. But before I get into what, what brings us together and, and, uh, and hand over to the distinguished um, speakers to, to come, um, I'd like to do something that, that I don't get to do in Switzerland uh, very often at all, um, which is an acknowledgement of country. Um, I left Australia in 2003. I've been away for 16, now 17 years. And in 2003, you may well remember, acknowledgement of country was uh, not that common and definitely not routine. But I think, you know, as I get shocked back into this every time I land back in Australia, I like to also reflect on the fact that this is a really important recognition of how our relationship with both time and space changes and is mediated um, in a long line of history. And the history in this place is the acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather here, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nature, na nation. And I'd like to, to pay my respects and our respects um, to the elders past, present and emerging um, from, from those groups, from those peoples. So um, I think that, in a way, is part of this social connectiveness that lights up the discussion that we're going to have tonight. There is, in addition to an acknowledgement of country, a, a welcome on behalf of Swinburne to, to all of you, and in particular to um, some very special guests. So thank you, of course, uh, Chancellor John Pelez, OAM, uh, Professor John Pelez uh, here. This is his lecture. Um, but of course, Vice Chancellor, uh, Linda, Linda Christensen, uh, two previous chancellors in the audience tonight, Dr. Bill Scales and Mr. Graham Goldsmith, thank you for being here, members of the Swinburne Executive, the Swinburne Council, and all of you for taking the time to be here. Now, my role as MC is obviously to um, set the scene a little bit, but also to outline some important housekeeping uh, uh, activities. So can you please reach into your bag or pocket and just double check that your mobile phone um, is switched to silent or aeroplane mode or has been left in the taxi, what, whatever is your preferred method uh, here tonight. Um, and in the very unlikely event that we need to suddenly exit this building or this room, um, given an emergency, it will be uh, through the doors on my left, the usual uh, green uh, signs and the, the great stuff here at Swinburne will guide you. Let me finish this intro by saying that we are incredibly privileged to be here tonight. Um, I work in countries all around the world and I come to Melbourne and I think, oh my gosh, what an amazing, clean, efficient and lovely place to be able to spend time. We're privileged to be here. I think we're also incredibly privileged to live at this time in history. We are on the cusp at the beginning stages of a fundamental, a, tra a, a huge transformation, not just driven by technology, but by driven by the way that we as humans are interacting and, and shaping technological systems. And without giving too much away, I think opportunities like tonight to reflect on our collective and individual role in that transformation um, is some of the most important things we can do. And to give us a little bit more flavour on that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, then the Chancellor, Professor uh, John Polez, OAM, to introduce our speaker and uh, continue the evening. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. That was a wonderful welcome. Thank you very much, Nick. The only person that I uh, couldn't get to come along here tonight was my eldest son. When I said it was going to be a Chancellor's Lecture, you can imagine what he was expecting. I, uh, I do thank you all for joining us um, at what I think is going to be a very exciting and very timely uh, lecture tonight. 
And of course, it's my uh, privilege to uh, open uh, the event tonight, the Chancellor's Lecture for 2019. Now, our, our distinguished speaker uh, tonight, Professor Genevieve Bell, will uh, address a very important question. It goes to the, to the very thinking that Nick opened up with, and that's how humanity does come together with technology. And the question, wonder in the age of artificial intelligence, what is our place uh, in the future? is very timely. We're hearing more and more discussion about it now, and it's something and a subject that we all need to start to engage in. Now, Professor Bell brings a, a tremendous energy and insight to this topic, drawn from her experience as a cultural anthropologist uh, who has worked at the leading edge of technology uh, for a number of years now, and, and I think we'll benefit from those insights. She's also a very lively and engaging speaker who will challenge us all to think and to think deeply beyond what we already know. And I'm very much looking forward to that challenge. In fact, I've had a very long-standing interest both in, uh, in academic and in business in artificial intelligence, having started my career as an AI programmer, um, I don't want to say how many years ago, but in 1986, working on the uh, Collins Class Submarine Program. And it always shocked me in those days how um, the people we were working with, we'd, when you talked about AI, they almost had God in their eyes. And here we are, so many years on, starting to really see the evidence of that technology ha having some impact and starting to ask the real questions. I'm delighted to say, though, that Swinburne has been very engaged in this area for quite some time now, and particularly its interest in AI and in big data. Over the past year, we've appointed our first Wipro Chair in Artificial Intelligence, um, Professor Richard uh, Kovalchek, um, a very exciting appointment. And with the work that we're doing with Amazon Web Services, we've launched a new, uh, a new data for social good uh, cloud innovation center, which is the first of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. We've had other strong partnerships in the application of these technologies. For example, with the Epworth Healthcare and the Australian Red Cross, where we're seeing our students and researchers exploring data-driven technology solutions that address the challenges in healthcare, humanitarian aid, and in law. We know that to harness the potential of these new technologies, we also need to take the challenges head on. And we need to retain our human capabilities for deep and creative thinking. At Swinburne, we teach our students not just to collect data, but importantly, how to question it. The skills that we teach at university, critical thinking, observation, analysis, interpretation, and problem solving, are the very assets that are threatened if we do not understand the role of AI in guided decision making. And if we don't understand those, then we won't be able to confront the challenges and maximise the possibilities of these emerging technologies. Interestingly, in a recent study published by Swinburne Centre for New Workforce, it emphasised the need for workers to capitalise on their human qualities if they want to avoid being displaced by technology. It concluded that entrepreneurial skill, collaboration, empathy, are what differentiate us from, uh, as humans from AI and automation technologies and are the very qualities that we need to be mindful of and continue to develop. I'll build on this and say that independent thought, even better, extraordinary thought, are key parts of what makes the difference, of what makes us human and is the core strength that we can harness and, and as we face these interesting challenges. If I said to any one of you in the audience tonight, have an extraordinary thought, well, why don't you now? Have an extraordinary thought. It's not that easy, is it? So do you know how to, how to understand when a thought is truly extraordinary? I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> I promise I won't do it too often, Linda. It's by understanding current thinking. And it really is that ability to contrast current thinking to new thinking that enables us to understand when it's genuinely new. And that is being human. It's that kind of reflection. Too often today, we're teaching people to gather information. And we're seeing in politics, in business, 
in the community, in the media, a tendency to jump immediately from observation to action, missing those critical steps of analysis and interpretation that guide you to better decisions and better outcomes. It's all too easy, as we know today, for us to look down, to look down at our phones, to look down at our computers. Our mission as a university is to encourage our students, our staff, our partners, both in research and industry, to look up. Look up and encourage and develop new ways of thinking. Look up and understand the world. Look up and think through the consequences. Look up and ponder the question, what is our place in the future? And so that's why I am so delighted to have somebody of Professor Genevieve Bell's stature and thoughtfulness to present to us tonight. As a futurist, as a technologist, she's widely recognised for her work in the intersection of these kinds of cultural practice questions and technology development. She's Vice President at Intel Corporation and a senior fellow, the highest company technical rank. During her almost two decades at Intel, Professor Bell has led social science research established the company's first user experience group and was widely recognised as a leading woman in technology. In 2017, she returned to Australia to join the Australian National University as the inaugural director of the 3A Institute, Florence Violet McKenzie Chair, and as a distinguished professor. At the 3A Institute, Professor Bell is leading a program to tackle complex problems around artificial intelligence data and technology and managing their impact on humanity. It's my very great honour and privilege to now invite Professor Genevieve Bell to the podium to deliver the 2019 Chancellor's Lecture. Well, this is a distinguished audience indeed. I want to acknowledge the Chancellor, apparently both of his predecessors and the entire of the extended Swinburne community. I also want to acknowledge my father, who is sitting in the front row, who is part of that extended community, who is both an alumni and a teacher here back in the 1980s. It's a rare opportunity that I get to talk to my father and to this whole crew. So I'm very excited to be here, and it's an honor and a privilege. I too, much like Nick, want to reflect that it's a wonderful thing for me to come home to Australia and to be able to begin every time I talk with acknowledging that we meet on Aboriginal country and be able to think about that not just as a ritual, but as a privilege and a responsibility for all of us as Australians and indeed as visitors, and a ritual we should take when we go to other places. Because being reminded that we meet in a place that has been continuously occupied for 60 to maybe 80,000 years is an extraordinary thing to think about. And whenever I get to talk about technology, I also get to remember that I do that in a place where humans have built technical systems at scale for at least that long. Less than a month ago, the United Nations and UNESCO certified a site here in Victoria that's six and a half thousand years old of an Aboriginal piece of technology that managed eels at scale. Not necessarily the kind of thing you think about managing, but you know, it was a system that was designed to manage water and rivers and contain food and make it possible for people to gather in one place and have conversations. It's not the only system like that. If you will go to the New South Wales-Queensland border to a town named Bawarana on the Barwon River, you would find a water system there that was built 40,000 years ago. It extends over a kilometre and it manages water through eight separate ponds to create a system that let you store fish at different sizes over different periods of time to sort them by age and by edibility and to keep them in cool water pools so that you could bring people from multiple nations to one place. The last time that system was used was in 1934. It is genuinely astonishing to think about what it would mean to build a technical system that lasted 40,000 years. For all of us in the room, that's probably unimaginable, but I like to imagine it's inspiring. I also like to imagine that means every time we talk about technology in this place and in this country, we do so with that as our history and our legacy and not a thing that's in our past, but a thing that's part of our active present. Which means I too want to acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal country. I want to pay my respects to Indigenous people in the room and to elders past and leaders present and emerging. And I want to think that that's not just a ritual that's foreign, but ought to be part of our DNA. 
That should also tell you I'm not the usual kind of person to be giving a conversation about AI. I kind of realize there's lots of ways you could describe me, uh, and the chancellor did a really good job, but here's the pieces that he missed. So yes, I spent 20 years at Intel, uh, but I ended up at Intel because in true Australian fashion, I met a man in a bar <laughs> in Palo Alto in the 1990s. It's probably not a good story to tell in front of my father, I come to realize now. Um, but like many things in Silicon Valley in the 1990s, it was a time of incredible exuberance and optimism. I wasn't looking to join the tech field. I was, as the chancellor says, an anthropologist. My area of expertise was Native American studies and feminist theory. Yeah, pause and imagine. Native American studies and feminist theory and ending up at Intel. The only way that would happen was to meet a man in a bar. <laughs> now, I was lucky that man had a vision for what people like me might offer and he was persistent. Because when he said to me, what do you do? I said, I was an anthropologist. He said, what's that? I said, I studied people. He said, why? I probably should have guessed at that point he was an engineer. Um, <laughs> but I diligently answered the question and said, because I found them interesting. He said, what do you do with that? I said, I'm a professor. And he said, couldn't you do more? And I thought, yes, I could stop talking to you. It's the most uninteresting conversation for me. And I didn't think anything more about it, because while my father may be an engineer and a graduate of this place, my mother is an anthropologist and an eminently sensible woman and told me never to give my number to strange men in bars. And he was one, so I left. Which meant when he called me the next day at my home, this was confusing. Because we are talking before Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter or Tinder, before Google, though these days were you to type redheaded Australian anthropologist into the nice little white box at Google, I am the first search term that comes back. But back in 1998, he did this the old-fashioned way. He called every anthropology department in the Bay Area when he got to Stanford and said to the secretary of the anthropology department, do you have a redheaded Australian? She said, oh, you mean Genevieve, and gave him my home phone number. <laughs> so I got my job in a tech company because I hung out in bars and Stanford had bad privacy practices in the, in the 1990s. I took that job, though, because although it wasn't what I was raised for, I grew up in Aboriginal communities in Central and Northern Australia. I grew up in universities surrounded by academics and places like this. I was also raised by my mother to believe that you had a moral obligation to make the world a better place than the place you found it. A moral obligation that should be not about making it better for you, but about making it better for others and other people who wouldn't necessarily find themselves in the conversation. And when Intel came calling, I realized that what I knew how to do as an academic might work in a tech company and that if it could work in a tech company, it would be something genuinely extraordinary to take what I knew about human beings and make that part of the process around innovation. Little did I realize that in doing that, I was also going to get an education about what it meant to think about technology. And that means for the last 20 years, I've been part of a whole series of conversations that have unfolded in Silicon Valley about what it means to talk about what computers can do, what they should do, what they will do, it means that I've watched all of that unfold around me, and two years ago, as the Chancellor said, I was lucky enough to come home again, to come back to the town I finished high school in. There's a rule against not doing that that no one told me. And so for the Australians in the room, think of it as a giant fang around the block, and I found myself at home again. And now I get to talk about things like this. So what would it mean to think about the relationship between computation and creativity? Because that's really what this is about. What does it mean to think about contemporary technology and creativity. My taxi driver on the way here said to me, ah, you know, the thing that makes us human is that we're creative, computers will never be creative. And so we had a lovely argument for half an hour getting here about that very topic. And I started by saying to him, listen, for as long as there have been computers in Australia at least, those objects have not just been about the rational and the productive, they haven't just been about efficiency, sometimes they've been about, well, something a little different. That's Syrac behind me. Depending on how you count it, it's either the, the second or the fourth stored memory computer in the world. There was the ENIAC, then depending on how you cut it, there's the Harvard Mark I, there's Babe in Manchester, there's a few other computers around. There was also Syrac. It was turned on at the University of Sydney in 1949. It was decommissioned from the University of Sydney and brought to the University of Melbourne in the 1950s. And it stayed here at the University of Melbourne for nearly 20 years. 
It did calculations that let us build the Maya Music Bowl. It did calculations around everything from home loans and interest rates to calculating the odds on the Melbourne Cup. It was a genuinely marvelous object. It was also as big as, like it was at least as big as this whole space here. It was loud and noisy. And because it operated its memory system using sound, it had one other remarkable feature to it. CYRAC turns out to be the first computer that ever made music. In 1951, at a conference of people who used computational objects in Sydney, CYRAC was programmed to play music. Now, I have to warn you in advance, the music is terrible. Uh, the review in the Argus at the time said that it sounded like a refrigerator defrosting in tune. <laughs> and remember, 1951, and this is the music that it played. We'll see if we can make it work. Yeah, it wasn't a game changer. <laughs> No one thought, gosh, we should teach computers to play more music. But what it did remind people was that even objects that were the most technically sophisticated of their day, that were doing math at a scale that was unimaginable, were also capable of doing other things. This same computer was one of the very first computing gaming platforms in the world. The dials that you can vaguely see in the distance there, you could track lights across them. And one of the very first women who programmed this, a woman named Kay Sullivan, taught it to play a game that sounds remarkably like Pong, which demonstrates my vintage, and she was good enough that she beat it. So let us imagine Australia's first gamer was not only a woman, but she was better than the computer, which is kind of a happy thought too. So here you have 1950s, computers making music, and everyone knew that was a kind of a side gig, right? But by the 1950s, there's a whole other argument that starts to proceed about what computers will be. 1956, Dartmouth in the United States, a group of mathematicians and logicians gather to have a conversation about what might happen if computers continue to grow at the pace and speed that they had grown from the 46 ENIAC to 56, which is at that point computers had gone from being the size of this area I am walking in to being about as wide as me. And they had gone from requiring the power of six suburbs to do one very small operation to being a lot more energy efficient and a lot more powerful. And so for the men who gathered in Dartmouth, they imagined that that continuing rate of progress would exceed and that computers would get more and more powerful. And the question became, well, what are you going to do with that? And so the United States government, in conjunction with this group of people, set about themselves this question of what would it be to do something with computers? How would you take advantage of all that power? And they came up with this formulation, that what it would be about was to make machines use language to form abstractions and concepts, to solve the kind of problems now reserved for humans. Any of us who've ever written a grant recognize that as the dodge in the sentence. And then improve themselves. They also imagined that you could break down what it was that humans did into sufficiently small pieces that a machine could be made to simulate it. They called that artificial intelligence. And if you think about 1956, what is the biggest existential risk facing the United States in 1956? Pick a country, that's right, Russia. And part of what they hoped they could do using this agenda was take advantage of the power of compute to understand the Russians. It wouldn't be about simultaneous translation, it would be instantaneous translation. Understand language as it happens. Understand the concepts that are embedded in language, because this group of people knew enough to know that the words aren't always the same as the meaning, and being able to understand abstract concepts like democracy and communism might be necessary. They hoped that you could make the machines effectively trigger military action, and that they would learn over time and become quick. Of course, we all know this mostly didn't happen, right? This first AI agenda didn't come to pass. One of the early protagonists who was at this event said about 10 years later that when they started to try and teach the machines to understand speech, they came to understand that language wasn't as simple as words, right? That words and meaning had a complicated relationship. Apocryphally, they tell the story of trying to teach the machine the phrase, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And the translation came back, the meat is bad and the vodka is strong. 
basically from ecclesiastics to a restaurant review. Not such a good look, right, if you're trying to imagine teaching a machine to speak. And so money is invested, people think. But by the 1960s, computers have moved into other places and people are doing other things. In 1966, this piece of art is made by a computer. See this here? It's the very first piece of art a computer ever made. It's called Return to a Square. You can see the square in the middle and the square on the outside. For those of you in the room who care, this was made with Fortran. For those of you in the room who know Fortran, you're like, no way, and the answer is yes way. It was made in Japan by a group of people who had a notion that computers should be used not just for productivities and efficiencies, but also to do and augment the things that people most cared about. They wanted to think about what it would mean to imagine creativity and culture and human endeavors as well as the technology. This piece of art was first shown in an exhibit in 1968 in San Francisco and in London. The exhibit was called Cybernetic Serendipity. In San Francisco, when it premiered, it was directly across the street from the Joint Annual Computer Machinery Conference, where in 1968, as this art is across the street, a man named Douglas Engelbart showed off the mother of all demos. He displayed the mouse, the internet, computer graphics, cut and paste, hyperlinking. And at that same event, a man from Stanford turned up with the curriculum for computer science. So 1968, big year for what computers would mean, right? And competing ideas. Was it about a programming language? Was it about an interface? Would it be about art? We kind of know the art didn't necessarily win, win out, right? And what we got to instead as the years have progressed is a very different understanding of what AI would be. It wasn't about art and creativity. It became about killer robots <laughs> and job loss and ideas about improved productivity and the kind of conversations that circle around us now in the pages of our newspapers, in the discourse of our governments, in the logic of the companies that we engage with every day. AI is now seen as, well, a tool. It's seen as a tool to improve workplaces, a tool to improve certain kinds of abilities to find the content you want, to find the candidate you want, to find the place you want, to find all manner of things, right? It's seen as being very much about this notion of things being both simpler and faster. It's made possible by 60 years of advances in computational power. What got lost sometimes in that story, though, was what are the other things you might be able to do with all that computation and why you might want to do them. So what made it be to kind of put those things back together again, right? If you take that original starting point from 1956 about what AI is, basically, it's about data. <laughs> That's how the machines were going to learn. It's about some sense of algorithms, so how are the machines going to make sense of the data. It's clearly about what are the learning mechanisms that would be involved there, how will those machines learn over time. And then, of course, it's about what other data will feed into those systems beyond the original data sets. So if you just took those pieces and started to ask the questions of might there be art and wonder in any one of those, you could start with this. Believe it or not, this picture was created by a Roomba. That would be a robotic vacuum cleaner for those of you not in the know. Um, so robotic vacuum cleaners happen to be the largest install base of robots on the planet. If what you do is take your Roomba, as this wonderful Japanese digital artist did, and take the dust sucking vents and turn them into paint blowing vents, you can take the pattern of your dirt and detritus in your house and make it into art. Because what this is is the pattern of someone's house. This is effectively toast crumbs manifested as art, right? This is a what happens when you take the pattern of the vacuum cleaner running around cleaning Philip's house and turn it into art. Now, is that art in the classic sense? No. But have we used ideas about visualizing data to make art? Absolutely. Have we think about impressionism, think about pixelated forms, think about all the ways that we have rearranged the world in terms of small objects to make things that you might argue were or weren't art? I'm not sure I want to argue about whether this is or not, but I know the people who think about data and patterns in the data are intimately tied to how we create new forms of content and new sorts of experiences. And lots of other people worry about it too. At Caltech, there's an artist in residence. He's a painter. 
His job is to help the physicist find ways of making better manifestations of their data, of finding different connections in it. He had one collection of physicists spend a semester with him looking at art in galleries in order to let them think about how you tell a story and how you think about how objects are related and manifested. We equally know that at companies like Netflix, they used data to determine that there were some exquisitely interesting spaces that sat in between the content that existed and the aspirations that people had and said, maybe sitting inside those spaces is the opportunity to make new content. Did the computers make the content? No. Did they find a space where the content could be made? Yes. Did they identify a place where the content might sit? Sure. I don't know what we do with that, but I know it's a form of creativity. And I know it's intimately related to how we might think about wonder. Not necessarily by a computer, but certainly made possible by it, right? And then you could think about algorithms. So I know for many people, someone says algorithm, and we all just think, oh my god, what is that? Algorithms are really straightforward. If you have ever used a washing machine, you have encountered an algorithm. Because if you've ever used a washing machine, someone decided that the wool cycle, cold, not a lot of spin, no agitation, one rinse. You don't have to program the machine to do all that. You don't have to push all the buttons. Someone decided that when you push the wool button, the machine sits behind it and makes a whole series of decisions for you. It's all an algorithm is. It is simply the automation of a series of tasks that are seen to have some kind of relationship to one another. One of the challenges, however, about algorithms is how you decide what is related and what is connected. So how do you decide that it's cold water, low spin, no agitation? Well, any of us who've ever washed wool in hot water know exactly how you made that decision. <laughs> but when you think about how people are deciding what algorithms will do and how you make those choices, it's a little bit more complicated, right? There's two schools of thought about this. There's the one that says humans are the ones determining the sequence. So humans are the ones determining what the steps are. And the second, more emergent thread is the one that says computers and data will determine what the relationship is. If you pick this sort of content, you might like that kind of content. If you like that kind of content, other people just like you also like this kind of content. Now, of course, one of the interesting challenges to that sort of algorithm, usually called a recommendation engine, you will have seen them if you use Netflix or I view on Amazon, I view on ABC, and there's lots of them you will have encountered. What those algorithms do is they're based on the notion that the familiar is good. So if you liked this, let's find things that are like it and things that are a little bit further away from it but still kind of like it. There's a sort of a thread that runs through it, right? And I'm willing to bet for most of us, we know the seduction of the familiar. That's why we talk about comfort food and comfortable clothing. There's something really nice about something that feels like all the other things, right? So here's the other thing about mostly being human is that it's familiar, 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 mm, starting to get a little bit bored and irritated, still familiar, desperately hoping for something else, and you're still giving me familiar. Traditionally, in the content industry, people who made music and movies, they were really good at identifying that moment when we were getting to that point of thinking, I'm done with reality TV shows about housewives and I'd like something else. And they were really good at anticipating mm, maybe enough of synthesizers and maybe a little bit of rock and roll, or maybe it'll be hip hop. They understood when that moment was coming. One of the challenges to these kind of algorithms is that they don't. What they do instead is reproduce that endless cycle of the familiar, the familiar, the familiar, which means they're inherently conservative. It also means if you imagine these algorithms become more popular and more prevalent, it would be very hard to see things that made you uncomfortable and it would be very hard to see things that were different from the things you were already looking at. Think about every time you open, well, in my case, Google Apps. Usually I'm opening a map because I'm in a different city, and as Jed knows about me, I'm usually looking for coffee. And the app is very good at telling me where the coffee is. It's an interesting thing to contemplate if what the app said to me instead was, yeah, we know you need coffee, but if you go another three blocks that way, there's a piece of art that's confronting and difficult, and you should go see it anyway. So what it would mean to imagine that what we should be doing is creating algorithms that are discomforting, that aren't just about serving up all the same things again, that are about the challenge that many of us disliked in school when we were made to read something we didn't agree with, or where our parents dragged us somewhere and went, it's gonna be good for you. 
And you're like, it won't be. <laughs> and yet we remember them. Or the moments we got horribly lost somewhere traveling and found ourselves in the place we didn't expect to be. We remember that better than the place we should have been. How we think about designing an entire class of digitally intimated experiences that would let us do that is about what it might mean to think about how artificial intelligence, or at least in this case, algorithms, could deliver a little bit of delight or wonder, or at least a challenge. And for me, when I think about the virtues of creativity and wonder, they aren't always about because they let us be in the same place. It's because they push us and move us to other kinds of places. And then, of course, there's this. This is Edmund Bellamy. Edmund Bellamy sold at Christie's in October of last year for $425,000 US. Edmund Bellamy was made by an algorithm. And in fact, he was made by an artificial intelligent system known, well, as a GAN. In this particular instance, someone took 15,000 paintings from the 14th to the 20th centuries and trained two computational systems across that entire portfolio of art. And once those two computational systems that started out the same had roamed around in 15,000 portraits, machine number one was asked to start producing portraits inspired by that 15,000 <coughs> catalog. And machine number two was instructed to take that piece of art and compare it back to the 15,000 paintings and say, yeah, nah, <laughs> yeah, nah, nah, still not, still not right, still not right, still not right, until eventually computer number one made Edmund Bellamy. And computer number two couldn't tell if Edmund Bellamy might just be the 15,001 painting. It didn't know it wasn't real. And for the person who bought it, sitting on the bottom of this painting where the artist's signature should be is the string of code that is the algorithm. Now, is that art? Probably not, not yet. Does it matter that it was made by a computer? Does it matter that it was made by an algorithm? Is it the case that for any one of us who has a momentary impulse about making something new, we never escape the fact that we lived in a world where we've seen the moral equivalent of 15,000 pieces of art. We may be trying to perform against them, but they're sitting somewhere in our visual cortex. What would it mean to allow that that might be a piece of art? What would it mean to think about allowing that a computational system may have some kind of impulse? Now, of course, the challenge there is we know at least right now that probably isn't a creative act on the place of the computer. It is merely performing its code. I think you can make an argument that certain kinds of code are themselves creative acts, and the people who write them are in fact engaging in the making, and in making they are making things possible. This won't be the first painting we see from this kind of activity. Indeed, there was a project done contemporaneous to this called the Rembrandt Project, where people introduced this same computational array, not this exact one, but one like this, to all of Rembrandt's works and then tried to produce a fake Rembrandt. In so doing, what they actually made clear was that a number of things classified as Rembrandt's might not be, <laughs> which is a different kind of problem. <laughs> so, art or not, wonder, absolutely. And maybe that's the important piece, right? That it's possible to think about it as being wonderful without needing to imagine that it's art. Of course, there are other people working in this space who have different intentionalities. There's at least one large music subscription company who is using the same kind of techniques to make music. Uh, so if you have a playlist that you exercise to, that music has a particular kind of quality. It turns out you can use computation to produce music of that kind of genre. The advantage to that is, of course, you do not have to pay copyright. And there are no usage rules. And so you start to imagine here some very different reasons why this might also be done, right? It's about fees and subscriptions and about who owns the rights to things, all become part and parcel of what it might mean to think in this space. And then you have to play it forward just one more sort of click and ask yourself the question, 
okay, if those are the pieces of a static AI, data, algorithms, learning techniques, a dynamic AI system has a whole series of sensors by which it encounters the world and gathers more data. Cameras, RFID, sensors that determine temperature and movement. At the moment, there's not a lot being done with those, except they let us see the world completely differently. If you were to hack the Wi-Fi network in this room, and I'm not recommending it, I have to look at the chance, like I'm not recommending you should hack the Wi-Fi network. But if you did, one of the things you could use that network for is not to determine who's in the room and who's connected to it, but you can actually use it to determine where I am standing and where my hands are as I am holding them aloft. Because the way I break the air and the way I break the pattern of the Wi-Fi will reveal an image of me. It effectively becomes a way to see through walls. It becomes a different way to see things. The same way the moments at which we were able to have telescopes and microscopes and magnifying glasses and optical lenses let people see the world differently and produce different art. The moment that the camera came along and changed the notion of what figurative landscapes should look like. The idea when color photography came along and changed our notions about, well, what looked good on camera and what didn't. The things that looked good in black and white and the things that looked good in color meant that for a whole generation of cinematographers in Hollywood, well, Edith Head survived, but a lot of other people didn't. Because what it meant to look good in black and white wasn't the same as what it meant to look good in color. Changes in technology have always changed the way we saw the world and what we did with it and the kinds of things that were possible. We have an entire new array of sensors that will do the same thing. They're gonna make it possible to see things or perceive things or be able to make sense of the world in a way that has not been possible. And I don't know where that takes us, but I know it will make possible completely different ways of imagining things and completely different ways for machines to make sense of the world. Which leads me in some ways to this last kind of moment, right? Like many of us in the room, I have grown up watching and reading science fiction. Like many of us in the room, uh, those are always complicated things. Uh, but lurking in my head is a quote from Arthur C. Clarke who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I'd actually push Arthur one step further and say a good advanced technology should deliver magic. It should be possible to make things that feel extraordinary and strange. I've had two moments like that with technology in the last three years. I was lucky enough to be in the Globe in Stratford-on-Avon when The Tempest premiered there three years ago. It was a partnership between the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Imaginarium, and Intel, my old company. We had more compute in the Globe that night than it takes to keep the space shuttle in the air. And we made Ariel fly. We made him fly using augmented reality. We made him fly using real-time motion capture. We made Prospero into a man whose staff actually unlocked the tree and Ariel fell out and flew. And it gives me goosebumps just talking about it now and it was the most extraordinary thing to be in a theater when you know that had Shakespeare had access to that technology, he would have used it. This was a man who when he performed would insist, this is one of the greatest things I've ever heard, he used to insist that the women of the court came with all of their jewelry on because it made reflective lights for him in the audience. He would insist they came wearing everything they had that glistened because it let this aura to the room. He would have loved this stuff. He would have thought it was great. So we know that's possible, right? This is from an exhibit that was at the Saatchi Gallery in London about this time last year. This is a virtual reality thing. It looks a bit like a religious ecstatic moment, I grant you. What's fascinating about it is as those people's hands are moving, the scene behind them is moving. And so you don't have to be in the headsets to have an experience of the world they are seeing and their bodies make the world around you change too. Virtual reality is sometimes accused of being a little bit solitary, but I thought this was a really interesting instantiation of what it might look like differently. There's a young woman in the town I now live in, in Canberra. Her name's Michaela Jade. She has a company called InDigital and she is creating augmented reality objects from her people in the Northern Territory. She has a series of cards that when you run a camera over them, the Yulungu come out and talk. 
and this set of spectoral figures in language will dance across the card in your hand. It's the most extraordinary and beautiful thing. And it starts to suggest to me that there must always be the capacity to take technology, not just for productivity and efficiency gains, which are amazing, and all of us in this room have benefited from it. But it must also be possible to use those same technologies to do something a little bit different and something a little bit magical. And for me, that feels like a really particularly good end goal. Now, the Chancellor said at the beginning, I was running an institute in Canberra, and indeed I am. And part of the task of that institute is very much consumed with these questions about what does it mean to think about our future? What does it mean to think about how technology will unfold? What it will mean to think about what that technology will do, with whom, and under what circumstances? And what other ways we may or may not choose to engage with it, use it, and manage it? We have one deeply ambitious goal, which is to build a new branch of engineering to manage those technical systems safely to scale. I think what it means to imagine this kind of AI is not just the precept of computer scientists. I think it is about a combination of Norbert Wiener's work on cybernetics nearly 60, 80 years ago, as well as ideas about what it would mean to think about systems that involve people and technology and the environment and how you hold all those things together. So, you just got to learn a whole lot about AI and art. I have one request from all of you, which is that we are looking for our second cohort of students. We're halfway through an experimental master's this year. We had 173 applicants for 10 slots this time last year. I like to compete with myself. I'd like more for this year. <laughs> we are currently looking for graduate students for next year. So if any of this sounds like something that you are interested in or you know someone who is interested in, please send them our way. 3Ainstitute.org will find us. We're accepting applicants until the end of the month. That's the end of my advertising. <laughs> and let's me just end by saying kind of three things, right? One is that I think it is always really tempting to imagine that technology and humans have an oppositional relationship. I should think it is possible to imagine that that is both an augmenting relationship and a collaborative one. I think that's only possible if we are willing to have conversations about what technology can do outside and in addition to the stories we tell about efficiencies and productivities and jobs and labor. And when instead we acknowledge the fact that as humans, every one of us in this room has grown up with technology that was never about that. If you like television, if you've ever listened to the radio, if you have fallen asleep with grandstand going because we might actually win the ashes back, you know that technology isn't just about efficiencies, right? You know it's about other things. And so for me, that piece about how do we constantly keep connecting our humanity and the things we care about as citizens, as human beings, as people of a particular place and time, that's actually what is necessary to make technical systems that we want not just to live with, but that we'll thrive with. So that, I want to stop and say thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. That was fantastic. And um, look, we're, as always in these events, there's never enough time to have the challenging conversations we want to have. But I'm going to um, you know, take the opportunity as MC to at least turn to the audience for, let, let's have at least three questions, three challenging questions. And when I say questions, I, I do mean questions, right? Which means, you, like, good Australian your voice goes up at the end. Yes, exactly. Inflection at the end, couple of sentence question. You know what I'm talking about, the syndrome of question masquerading as, a, as an essay. This is not, not that moment. Uh, thanks, Genevieve. That was really absolutely fascinating and interesting. Um, I work in security, and I do a lot of work on drone warfare. So I was interested to see what your impression or how you understand the implications, for instance, of algorithms, technology, in the realm of security and defence, what it might mean, for instance, to the changing idea of warfare, security, mm -hmm. human rights, etc. Fantastic. Thank you. Question. The gentleman there on the left. Perfect. <coughs> Sir. Um, actually, I was going to say, ask a very similar question. <laughs> My question is relating to the fact that technologies have both positives and negatives. 
One of the difficulties we're seeing now is the use of AI in military. What are your thoughts about that? Very much. And then the gentleman with the black jacket and green jumper. Um, so I'm working in a different area in uh, manufacturing research. So when you're saying AI improve productivity, safety, so on, I resonate in my heart. But I want to uh, pose a question from a different angle about very resistance of human beings. What's your thought about artificial beings and how we human beings, the natural beings, you know, live, work together with artificial beings? Is there a danger along the line the artificial beings will get out of control? Thank you. Yeah, well, Thank you very much. Genevieve. Right, well, that's an, interesting, that's an interesting swath of questions. I'm going to go there first and then tackle those two, I think. So, listen, I think one of the really interesting things about the language of artificial intelligence and the way it often gets framed is that it imagines it's an oppositional point to the human. Uh, one of my favorite roboticists is a man named Mori, a uh, Japanese roboticist, wrote an extraordinary book in the 1980s called Buddha and the Robot in which he argues that robots would be better Buddhists than humans because they were capable of infinite patience and infinite grace. <laughs> and in framing it that way, he immediately fragments the notion of what it might mean to be human and what the precepts of those things are, right? One of the challenges inside the English language is when you talk about artificial intelligence, it's easy to move from there to consciousness and sentience. It's kind of a semantic slippage, right? We don't do a good job of hearing the difference in those things. And then if you were raised inside many Western traditions, if something has intelligence, sentience, and awareness, the next thing it will do is kill us. We basically go from the robotic vacuum cleaner to kill John Connor very, very quickly. And part of the reason we do that is we have a 200 to 600 year legacy of our imaginations being shaped by the acts of literature in which human action doing the work of gods never ends well. So think Frankenstein and Gollum are the obvious ones inside the English and Western literary tradition. They're not the only ones, right? What's fascinating to me is part of the reason Mori could write about the notion of Buddhist robots was that he grew up inside a different cultural tradition that didn't imagine that humans were the only things that were sentient and didn't imagine that humans were the only things that had consciousness or awareness. And for him, he talks about the history of Karakuri, a kind of Japanese automata, and about the notion of those things as being living, breathing, sentient objects. And for him, his argument is usually the reason that Humans like to imagine that artificial humans are dangerous is because humans are projecting their fears of themselves onto those objects. And as a man of a particular moment in Japan, he reflects on the fact that he grew up in the place where the worst thing humans had ever done to each other had happened in his hometown. And he basically says, our fear of the robots is rightly our fear of other human beings. And that what it then means to imagine that fear means locating it very specifically and very clearly. And I often think of his work and his argument as a way of saying a couple of things, right? One is that it's really important to remember that the ways we think about technology are also from particular places and particular cultures. They reflect very particular ideas. Even the phrase artificial intelligence like, there is a phrase from the 1950s when in America, artificial was excellent. It was like rayon and NutraSweet and things that were artificial and shiny were great. Were you making artificial intelligence in 2019? You'd probably call it bespoke resilience <laughs> or artisanal grit or some other kind of form that is much more a manifestation of our current moment in time, right? But if you think about and this is in some ways an answer to both the first and second questions too. The flip side of that though, why were those men gathered in Dartmouth in 1956? And why did they imagine that a machine was the right answer? Well, partly they imagined that because all of them had lived through World War II. Some of them were related to Holocaust survivors. At least one of them had been the man whose maths 
had enumerated the cities where the bombs would be dropped. Von Neumann did that. That was his, his maths. And I think for all of them, they looked at the world they had come out of, and they thought to themselves, human beings made all that mess, and that was really bad. Like, the 1940s, that had not been a good experience for anyone. And I think in their best imaginations, what they imagined was that the machinery would be better than they were. That the thing about artificial intelligence was it was the promise of decision-making without emotions, without rancor, without foolishness, I think they imagined without prejudice and bias. Now, we can look at that now and think, how extraordinarily naive. But at that moment in time, with that history, I can understand how they found themselves thinking that the machinery would be tidier and less dangerous than the humans. Of course, the reality is we have come to know that every technical system is ultimately somewhere built by a human. And that means into every technical system is built all manner of things. Some of them more subtle and insidious than others. And so whilst we can ask the questions about the way that AI may be used in terms of weaponry, I don't think we need to go that far to find a scenario where we might want to ask questions about whether it's safe or not. You came into this building through one of two doors. Sitting at the top of that door was a sensor. That sensor opened the door when you stood in front of it. That sensor is designed to open that door for a particular kind of body. That sensor is actually designed to stop children getting in and out of buildings without their parents, which actually means that sensor is triggered only when you're about over this height and under about six foot four, because when those sensors were first designed, humans weren't mostly over that height. That means every door in this building imagines an ideal body. That body's not in a wheelchair, that body's not short, that body's not too tall. And the whole building is configured with imagined humans in mind. Most of you have in your pockets a mobile phone. Most of those phones will have cameras. Most of those cameras were built using algorithms that in turn rely on Kodachrome. Because Kodachrome was, of course, the most beautiful picture, so why wouldn't you take how that made images and turn it into the algorithms in cameras? Kodachrome, in turn, was built on technology that finds its way all the way back to the American Civil War, and a man named Matthew Brady, who photographed dead soldiers. Matthew Brady thought only certain soldiers were worth photographing, and all of those images were how he optimized the lens technology and the color contrast inside those objects for a very particular kind of, well, skin tone. Turns out, Celts like me, if you look at the images that those cameras made, it's people like my skin color contrast, my eyes, my hair work best. If you look at the five faces that Kodachrome was trained on, it's the same thing. That means that if you read Sidney Poitier's biography, he talks about the fact that being filmed the entire time through his career meant that he had to be triple lit because they couldn't get enough contrast on his skin and the cameras couldn't see him because they were designed to see a different thing. All of those legacies find their way into the object in your pocket now, which means they still see something that they were trained to see in the 1860s. All of which is to say, none of these technologies are without a context, none of those contexts are without a history, and none of those objects are without legacies that are deeply and profoundly complicated. What it means to imagine where those technologies sit and who uses them, is equally so. The question about security from the back is the thing. That same set of algorithms that made Edmund Bellamy are now the algorithms that we know how to use to hack a network. Because if what you do is teach a comp computer to basically go, right, here's the sum of the network. I will now attempt to validate the network. I'll attempt to determine whether that validation is OK. Imagine how quick it is to hack something that otherwise seemed unhackable. Likewise, imagine that same algorithm that makes Edmund Bellamy is the same way you can create, well, video that isn't true. It's the same way you can create images that are clearly not true. It's the same way you can create entire artifacts where they don't otherwise exist. But here's the thing to remember. 
artificial intelligence didn't create a desire for deep fakes. <laughs> we have been faking things using images for as long as cameras existed. Whether it is the fairies in the bottom of the garden for people like Lewis Carroll, whether it is the compromise of the Russian oligarchy, whether it was the endless people disappearing off the balcony at the May Day parades with just the trailing legacy of the coffee cup and the cigar on the rail, we have been using images to tell stories that weren't true deliberately. Every new piece of technology is inevitably, as you say, used for both good and for bad. The challenge here, I think, is more subtle. I think one of the ways to think about this is to ask yourself the question about what is the consequence of the three AI winters that I so lovingly glossed over. But basically, the moments where all the money went away from AI and the research continued. What's interesting is the moment when that last AI winter happened is the moment where the government funding, at least in the United States, never came back in Britain, never came back at scale, and who filled the hole instead was industry. And so you went from government funding of artificial intelligence, algorithms, and technical systems to commercial funding. And there, for me, is a much more interesting question about what it means to have a world where an entire suite of technical systems are being built by commercial enterprises, where those objects don't necessarily ever speak to each other. They manifest completely different ideas about the world, but they also create an inordinate amount of complexity. And then you have to ask yourself the question, who would regulate that and under what circumstances? Will it be regulated at the nation state level? Will it be regulated at a transnational level? Who will do the regulation? Who will understand the system sufficiently to be able to do that? And what does that look like? And if that sounds like a lot of imponderable and unanswerable questions, that shouldn't be surprising. <laughs> Those are in some ways the big and imponderable questions that every new piece of technology has introduced. This one just has the particular distinction of managing at a scale we have never really seen before and at a speed, not the spread of the technology, but the technology itself that is different and new. And those are things that we shouldn't just be concerned about as consumers. They're things I think we should be concerned about as citizens. And for me, those are two quite important distinctions. And so now that I've frightened you all, <laughs> I'm going to tell Nick I'm stopping now. Fantastic. Thank you very Excellent. much, Genevieve.